Howdy. Welcome to another episode of Canon Calls. Thank you for joining us. This week, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Timothy Larson, a historian at Wheaton College, to chat about his book on George MacDonald. We talked about his effect on how we celebrate Christmas, his influence on C.S. Lewis, and his very random friendship with Mark Twain. Before we get going, I wanted to alert those of you with an Amazon Prime membership that out now, exclusively on Amazon Prime Video, Douglas Wilson's Man Rampant. Join Doug and his guests as they have uncompromising conversations about Christianity, leadership, and masculinity. These topics are sure to get you into trouble, and they might even change your life. Sacred cows beware. So without further ado, meet Dr. Timothy Larson. Okay, Dr. Timothy Larson, thank you for your patience with us. Welcome to Cannon Calls. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Dr. Timothy Larson teaches at Wheaton College, and he's the author of several books. Uh, but today, in particular, I wanted to talk to him about his book, George MacDonald, In the Age of Miracles. Uh, Dr. Larson, do you mind just introducing us to the person of George MacDonald, if we don't know who he is? Sure. George MacDonald was Scottish. He was from the 19th century, although he spent a lot of his life living in England. His Scottish identity was very important to him. He trained as a minister and had lots of kind of preaching tendencies. He actually wrote later in life unspoken sermons to kind of fulfill his preaching calling. But he decided really that he was meant to be a full-time writer rather than a minister. And so he's famous for his literature. He wrote a shelf full of novels and oodles of poems. Um, but he's famous primarily for two forms of literature. One is children's literature, which was just getting going in the 19th century. Up until then, children just had to read what was around for adults. They loved uh, Pilgrim's Progress because it was filled with imagery, but it was, Pilgrim's Progress was written for adults, not children. So uh, MacDonald and some of his friends, like uh, Lewis Carroll, who wrote uh, Alice in Wonderland, really get children's literature going in the 19th century. And he's famous for that. And he's also famous for fantasy uh, literature. He wrote these um, deeply strange and wonderful fantasy novels. And so he kind of pioneers two new forms of literature that had a, a huge impact on um, uh, authors and readers, uh, not just in his generation, um, but into the 20th century and then the 21st century. Is there anything historically that keyed into just the need for children's literature? Or what was it that up to that point you know, there really wasn't anything that was sort of marketed directly towards children. I think there are multiple reasons. On the most kind of banal, um, paper is getting cheaper and there were taxes on print that went away. So it's just possible to disseminate a lot more literature in the 19th century than it was earlier. And so when you can, you know, when, when it's cheaper, you can do more things. And so this becomes another thing that you can do. Uh, but I think there is a changed view that there's a kind of Victorian appreciation for the first time of childhood as a, a different kind of stage of life, not just a small person, but a person who um, learns differently, who thinks differently, and, and a less negative view of that. There was a, a view in the past often that the key thing about child rearing was to break their will. In the 19th century, there's more of a sense of, no, what you want to need to do is nurture children, that they have imagination and they have interests. And so the, the literature, there's a freedom for literature to be less kind of just moralistic and didactic, kind of here, children, here, you know, don't lie, don't steal, those kind of messages. And more of here's something fun and delightful that might kind of awaken you as an individual. So you mentioned we're in the 19th century. Uh, what what were his dates exactly? He was born in 1824, and he dies in 1905. Okay. Edward Lear, is he right there with him? They're, yeah, they're not close. Um, um, McDonald is close to lots of famous writers, but, but, but Lear I mentioned because he's another example of this new kind of writing that's going on at the same time. McDonald is very close to Lewis Carroll. He's close to Tennyson. He's close to Mark Twain, even though Mark Twain's American. They have a very strong relationship uh, so a lot of the authors of that era are part of his social, personal life, as well as this kind of common literary developments. 
I had opened up a book, I, I believe called The Key, that's about George McDonald, and I was shocked to see him in a picture with uh, Dickens. Yes. And yeah, just, and, you know, and you're just like, oh yeah, everybody, everybody did live n- near one another. Yes, everybody was in London. There's a I had this kind of theory that all of the Victorians that we know all knew each other, and it does feel that way a lot uh, because uh, there was a sense in which it was a small country, and if you did something interesting, people you know tend to cross paths over time. Now, your book, the scope of it is is a bit broader than just merely him and maybe his works. Uh, you're dealing a lot with his thought. Uh, there's a lot of history involved in it. Can you unpack the three sections of your book and uh, what you're up to there? Yes, certainly. So the, the first one is George MacDonald in the Age of the Incarnation. Uh, the Age of the Incarnation is playing off of a well-documented development in Victorian thought from the Age of Atonement, emphasizing Christ's death on the cross, and along with that kind of judgment and punishment, to the age of the Incarnation, emphasizing uh, Christ's birth, and along with that, the goodness of creation, the dignity of all of human life. And that shift um, parallels, I think, a shift toward, from Easter being the key Christian festival to Christmas being the, cre- the key Christian festival, which is certainly the socially, socially true fact for us today. And uh, the Victorian Christmas is very much our Christmas in lots of ways. Obviously, Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol, um, lots of things that we do at Christmas time are Victorian. Lots of the carols that we sing were written then. Um, and I'm arguing that those two things are interconnected, that, that there's a theological shift that leads to a more of a social cultural shift. And the McDonald is right at the heart of both of those things. He, he is an early adopter of the theological emphasis on the age of the incarnation or the incarnation as a doctrine. And he's also uh, somebody who's celebrating Christmas much more extravagantly and in ways that we think of as Victorian, but he gets there earlier than other people and represents uh, the kind of weight that we put on Christmas. Um, he uh, models that for us. So with that transition, was it the case that folks were celebrating Easter in a way that we celebrate Christmas, or was it not a ton of celebrating period, or, or what was what was the transition yeah. away from? Yeah, so um, a lot of Protestants, not least Calvinist, which is what uh, is the dominant tradition in Scotland and, and the way that McDonald grew up, um, were very suspicious of lots of the church year as um, Catholic and unbiblical. Uh, Easter is different because it always lands by definition on a Sunday, and everybody knows you're supposed to celebrate on Sunday the, the gospel. And so Easter kind of had a firm place in Protestant thought as we gather on Sundays anyway, it's already a day of rest, it's a holy day, and it's never wrong, and it's always right to celebrate Christ's death and resurrection. Um, but Christmas can land on any day of the week. And sure. so many people didn't celebrate it at all um, and saw it as this leftover thing where there's nothing in the Bible that tells you December 25th was when Christ was born, and so it's superstition or it's pagan or it's Catholic or something wrong. Uh, so in the 19th century is when Protestants get over that hang-up and fall in love with Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank God for it. Um, yeah, exactly. So with that incarnational emphasis, where does that bear out in his works? Yeah, so um, again, the, the, on, the, on the wider theological frame, he is always challenging the kind of judgmental, fearful, rejecting view of human life. This idea, like we talked about with children, that the key thing is to kind of just break the will and curb and there's an adult version of that, that if you're enjoying something, you're probably sinning. <laughs> and, you know, and so, right. so but, you know, they've got to keep everything under control. And McDonald will flip that and see, and the, and the incarnation does that. You see, the incarnation is God affirming our bodily reality in this creation. Hmm. And therefore, McDonald will say, love of nature, um, love of life, love of... Uh, another human being in a romantic sense, all of that is an expression of this amen to our embodied human life that comes in the incarnation. 
And so running throughout his novels is the, that, that theological corrective. Um, there's a story in one of his novels, which actually comes uh, from his own family history, from his grandmother, of her burning her son's violin because he seemed to be enjoying music too much. And she saw that as potentially, yeah, idolatrous or some kind of rivalry to the love of God. And McDonald is like, no, the, the, the God of creation is the God of the incarnation who has said yes and amen to our embodied human existence. And therefore, uh, we can enjoy music as part of the world that God created and has affirmed uh, in his own um, coming into this world uh, in Jesus Christ, rather than continually see it as some kind of Manichaean dualism where all of that is inherently tainted and bad and a threat. Is anyone at the time criticizing him in that in that transition? Is there any do people see him as a threat to anything going on or was this a well received transition? As I said, he's an early adopter and so there are other early adopters that get challenged for this um, and he does get some um, challenges for it as well. It's more on what you're not saying than what you are saying. Right. So um, he's not going to say um, a theory of the atonement that is as precise as um, the standard theories that are more substitutionary and penal. He's going to leave it kind of more as a mystery. And so people who think, no, you have to say that precisely are annoyed by his saying <laughs> it uh, more loosely. And from um, what I can tell, people might still be annoyed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, you think that some of this stuff is relevant, do you think? <laughs> oh, <laughs> my mistake. Well, no, I, um, even just, I, was, I had it on here for later. I'm curious if this is asked in every interview you're in, but uh, with his universalism or not, C.S. Lewis seems to kind of get him off the hook in The Great Divorce. What is your take? Yeah, and, and I certainly every q and I've ever done, when I've ever looked at McDonald, I get this question. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, so you're batting a thousand here. Yes, exactly. So I don't think that McDonald teaches universalism, okay. although he definitely is holding out a hope, if not a suspicion, uh, <laughs> that, you know, that all is ultimately redeemed. Okay. Um, but it's a much more gritty view than what people think of as universalism. So people tend to think of universalism as uh, there is no hell, there is no punishment, love just trumps everything else, and everybody's happy. Um, that's not McDonald's view. McDonald has a very rigorous, unflinching view of redemptive suffering, or just suffering as a consequence of sin, even if you're not allowing it to redeem you. Uh, sin leads to pain, and McDonald does not flinch at that at all. And if you die in sin, that pain is the pain of hell. And that pain is real and it is horrific. Um, but McDonald is not as convinced as classic theology was that it is um, eternal and that you cannot repent after um, death or be sanctified after death. So in some sense, McDonald's suspicion, at least, is that whether it is hell or purgatory depends on whether or not you're willing to allow yourself to be sanctified or not in the afterlife. The second part of your book, On Doubt. Yes. Could you tell us about that? Yes. So um, there, there was a great uh, Victorian uh, preoccupation with doubt which I think is often misunderstood by scholars today. Uh, scholars today tend to see doubt as equivalent to secularization and unbelief, and that's just historically wrong. I, I think it's better to think of doubt as a sign of an existential interest in faith. In fact, uh, there is no doubt without faith. Doubt is meaningless without faith. It always comes in the context of faith. To doubt something is to presume a context in which something is believed. So it's not the same thing as just um, unbelief. You know, um, so to doubt something is 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 to, to to be engaging with people who believe it, or and and that and and more often than not, the people believing it is a part of yourself. You know, so 
but nevertheless, it's really important. And I also think what McDonald understands, which I think is right, is that doubt is also an inevitable part of spiritual growth. That to doubt something is to think about it. And the, the way to get to a more mature, secure, right view of a doctrine is to think about it. And a byproduct of that is inevitably, inevitably doubt. To think about it seriously is to say, I wonder if that's really true or why it's true or how it could be true. Or if it's true, why is this also true? Or what about this other bit of evidence? So doubt is just part of the process of uh, appropriating an idea, grappling with an idea. And so he worries a lot, I think rightly, that too often what happened in the past, uh, including his childhood, was that any expression of doubt was immediately um, kind of moralized as you're being apostate or blaspheming or sinning or you're becoming an atheist. And so normal intellectual and spiritual growth where one wants to just understand, I don't understand this. I need to think about it. What does it mean? What does it not mean? How does it relate to other things that seem to be true? Um, was quickly kind of weaponized into this um, shaming or condemning mode, which then often pushed people out of the faith when they were trying to mature their faith rather than denounce it. But they meet some kind of bullying Sunday school teacher or minister or parent or whoever who then says, oh, you're an atheist, and they kind of believe them and say, okay, well, I guess I am, and go their own way. So McDonald tries to model both the um, not being frightened by doubt and then how to engage doubt in a constructive way that leads to a mature faith. Does he play with that in fiction, or is it predominantly nonfiction works that he's, that he's considering doubt? Yeah, it's both, but I think that it's um, particularly... Um, gets gets at you in a kind of unguarded, more effective way in his fiction. Uh, and that's even true in his um, children's work and his fantasy work. So in, you know, um, The Princess and Curdy and, and The Princess and the Goblin, those kind of books, a lot of it is about trusting, even though you don't understand something fully. And that will be a key McDonald move, that the question is not... Uh, can you explain all this? Do you know how it all works? Do you, do you understand it all in this exhaustive sense? But do you know a person well enough to trust them? And therefore, if they tell you to do something, are you willing to do it based on the trust of that relationship? Uh, and so that's what, uh, you know, Curdy has to you know, learn when told, you know, follow an invisible thread, these kind of things. Um, and he, and, and McDonald was using that to help us grow spiritually to say, um, do, do you trust Jesus Christ? Have you discerned that he is morally good and worthy of your discipleship? If that's true, then the question is not, do you understand how, all these doctrines and how they all work? Uh, what you understand is that if Christ has told you to do something, that you should do it. That's great. That's really good. And then how about the last part with the re-enchantment? Yes. So, uh, the, the last um, chapter is called George MacDonald and the Reenchantment of the World. Um, and I, 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 th I think that title works for that chapter, but it also was a way of making more exciting a chapter that's really about sanctification in lots of ways. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so that's some of what we talked about already right. um, in both, both the last two. Um, but it, it is um, reenchantment, certainly. Um, in the sense that uh, the Victorians just felt uh, the kind of closing in on the, of the modern world with factories puffing out their smoke, with their ticking clocks making you punch in and work all day, uh, with just money being the only value of things. There, there was so much that just felt like it had squeezed life uh, into an inhuman shape. And so re-enchantment was a way of breaking out of that to say, uh, and so for, for McDonald to write fairy stories is, is just a wonderful way of saying, I am not accepting your drab, utilitarian, money-centric factory world. I am going to see other realities and think about other realities and release the imagination. 
Uh, you see that in Charles Dickens' um, Hard Times, where he's satirizing that kind of uh, utilitarian education where there is no imagination, there is no mystery and story, there's only facts, facts, facts. And George MacDonald is, is doing that all the time in his work. Yeah. Um, but it is, yeah, go on. Sorry to interrupt. I was going to say. No, 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 I'm done. Charles Dickens is exactly who came to mind. Um, yes. And I'm curious to know, do you see them, even just how you described what Victorians are going through, that seems to me to be Charles Dickens' whole project of uh, oppressed by those kinds of factors. I'm going to attempt at pushing back. How would you differentiate between the two of them and maybe where there was excess or not, or would you see uh, that yes. identically, or how, how would you think through the yes. differentiation between the two? So, um, surprise, surprise, uh, Charles Dickens overall is, is a better author and writer. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. um, and, and McDonald at his worst um, can be too didactic. He, he He's too given to... Uh, filling his characters with edifying long speeches to get across his points. Uh, so that's McDonald at his worst. Um, but McDonald at his best has something that, that Dickens doesn't have. So Dickens is pretty much limited to exposing hypocrisy. That's what Dickens does in his novels over and over again. Uh, people are behaving in ways that um, are not the right way to behave to your fellow human beings that do not take into account their humanity. Um, where this um, un, uh, uh, releasing into uh, a realm of fantasy and imagination is something that McDonald has that McDickens doesn't have. So Dickens is only ever writing realist uh, novels in his novels. And it's interesting that the, that the exception to that uh, is his novella, uh, Christmas Carol, which is by far his most popular and famous and redone one where he does slip out of the realist realm into the realm of ghosts. And McDonald can do that much more freely and more often. So a lot of his writing um, can take us into a larger imaginative world than just uh, the kind of depiction of ordinary life. That's really good. You know, I, I don't think Dickens is hung enough for the sin of uh, sentimentality at times, if that's maybe going to be his ditch. I was wondering, too, if maybe that's that's his ditch because of the limited imagination. Yes, and it was, it's deeply related to the fact that Dickens um, doesn't know what to do with women. <laughs> uh, so so that, that's kind of what you get, you know. Okay. So um, he, he women in Dickens are either, uh, you know, terrible, evil people or their sickly, sweet, saintly people. Right. Um, and so, he, so what that tells you is that he can't really get at the inner life of a woman, which probably helps explain why his marriage wasn't a success. Um, and so, so then you get sentimentality, and what I think what people mean by that is this character does not ring true because they don't, they don't have a recognizable life with all of its complexity the way that we experience life. Um, and so you can have a heroine who's definitely a heroine, and, and we think this is a woman to be admired, but, she, but she's complicated because she has it in her life, and therefore she also has um, her weaknesses and foibles and temptations um, and pettiness. Um, and, and Dickens can't do that. He's got to just paint just in stark colors one way or the other. It's just all pastel or it's all dark for women. Um, and I think that's why uh, people... Um, what, the, what they call sentimentality is that failure to make complexity in in, in his women and child heroes. Right. I, and the child heroes, too. I think you're. Yeah. I yeah. think that's spot yeah. on. One of his popular works is Fantasties, back to McDonald. And I think it's been juiced with popularity because of its relation to C.S. Lewis um, and what he devotes to it in Surprised by Joy, where he says this is the book that really got me started on my journey and then he wrote the foreword to one of the somebody utilized something he'd said about it and made I it think it's forward. published in, in Lewis's lifetime there is an edition published with Lewis's okay. forward yes yep. awesome so I really really love Lewis and uh this is one of those things where I've wondered the one time I went through Fantasties like what am I missing this is such a strange <laughs> place what what's yeah. your take on it is that is it just the weirdest book yes. of all time so, so there there are two uh, very similar works that McDonald wrote, Fantasties and Lilith. 
And they're both deeply strange works. And <laughs> that's good, that's um, yeah, deeply strange. Uh, um, and there, so that can be very off-putting. <laughs> I totally get that, and I felt some of that. Um, but it also was exhilarating for people who hadn't experienced that before. Hmm. Uh, and so it's maybe I can help by getting some of the exhilaration, and particularly. The alternative, which had, which had existed up until that time, was kind of straight allegory, which is what uh, Bunyan is doing in uh, Pilgrim's Progress, which absolutely, like I was saying before, it was the one book that every child read. Uh, and so everybody knows this book. And, and, and part of the charm of Bunyan is that the allegory is so blatant, it becomes kind of um, elevated into the kind of kind of mythical categories, you know, and so, so you, you know, things are just called, you know, despair, you know, and so, right. you know, but they kind of set up an expect, expectation that, that that's what literature was. And in Fantasies and Lilith, they're not allegories. There is no one-to-one correspondence. Oh, now I see the trees uh, equal virtue or something like that. You know, it's like, it's, it's, yeah. it's not like that. Right. Um, it really is strange all the way down and it's, and it's incommiserately, you know, um, um, connected to, uh, some kind of moral. It's not, it's not map. You can't map it on to another reality. Uh, and he was getting, you know, all the time he would get letters, you know, that just said, you know, I know it's an allegory, but I wasn't able to penetrate it. Please tell me the key, <laughs> you know, and you know, and he's like, no, it's not, it really is not an allegory. Um, so, 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 so what was exhilarating about that partly was, was that then, well, then this world has an integrity of its own. So it, it really is, McDonald is truly a pioneer of fantasy literature. And so when you think about what, Tolkien does in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, what, what makes that compelling that we come back to it over and over again is we really believe this is a world that has its own integrity. It has its own rules. It has its own logic. It has its own um, endearing traits. And it's not a one-to-one correspondence, you know, and, and Tolkien himself all, often resisted that, you know, he, he didn't want it to be an allegory for, uh, the rise of the Nazis, you know, and that kind of thing. He's like, no, you know, it's obviously that stuff is in the stew, but, 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 it, but it's not reducible to that because it's a world that has its own integrity. And that's why we can return to it. It's not a thin world because, because we come back to it again and again. And so, uh, f- so, you know, so many things in literature, I totally understand the early versions of something are not as good as the later versions, but they're what make the later versions possible. Uh, so, you know, if you read early detective, uh, fiction, it's not very good. Um, but, uh, you know, it's heading towards Sherlock Holmes and Lord Peter Whimsey and Inspector Morse and all these things uh, that you'll love. And it's kind of like creating the genre and then other people are going to perfect it. Well, I feel chastised and I will, I'm going to give give it another shot. It's um, also possible that you're just a shallow person, you know, so I don't, <laughs> don't want to rule that out. You know, we can't we can't in times like these. So uh, <laughs> we've already mentioned folks that he was was close to, uh, not only just in contemporary of, but there are plenty of men who acknowledge him as somebody who had a major influence on them and probably folks that everybody's going to know sooner than they know McDonald. So you've already mentioned Tolkien. We've talked about Lewis and Chesterton. What was his impact on folks who came after him? Yes, I, I think um, th- there is a kind of large-hearted love of life in McDonald that people experience. That, that here's, again, you, you feel that way in Chesterton as well. And so I think Chester, you, you have kindred spirits, you know. So even if you don't agree with Chesterton, you kind of like enjoy his company because he's enjoying uh, being alive so much. Absolutely. Um, and, and you felt that. Uh, with McDonald, and I think they could recognize that in one another. Um, there's also, uh, you know, a strange thing that happened in the 19th century. The 19th century was a deeply Christian age, and yet the famous literary voices were often people who were um, somewhat skeptical or disattached from the church and Christianity in various ways. Uh, you know, again, so that will not be true 
when you get to the interwar period and all of a sudden it's T.S. Eliot and Auden and Dorothy Sayers and yes. Agatha Christie and yeah, yeah. Uh, Lewis and everybody else. So, so, so in some ways, McDonald kind of like is, is a rare in the same way that uh, Jamar Manley Hopkins. And you know, there's a few people who are like, here, there, here are people who were great literary voices. They clearly were good at their craft, who did real work of integrity, but also were comfortable in their own discipleship and following of Christ and held the gospel in their hearts in ways that didn't seem shamefaced or apologetic. Um, and so I think he's a witness uh, at a time when that combination of kind of A-list literary figure and unapologetic, um, sincere faith uh, was rarer. Yeah, and that I think what you were saying in terms of, you know, not the shamefaced, not a furrowed brow kind of religion, but they actually looked like they were having a good time. Yes, exactly. Oh, yes. I wanted to ask about Twain. So how did he yeah. and Twain uh, o- over in America, how did that even happen? Twain's children, again, we had this kind of invention of children's literature saying, love McDonald's books. Uh, they actually <laughs> read uh, um, at the back of the North Wind, I think, until it physically fell apart. They read it over and over again so many times. They're one, they're one copy. Wow. So I, 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 I don't really know is the honest answer, but I suspect it starts with the children of, of Mark Twain loving McDonald so much that he writes him a letter. And so it begins the correspondence. And then McDonald does a trip to America and they meet. And then Twain does a trip to Britain and they, and they, they meet there. Uh, they actually talked about in their enthusiasm uh, co-authoring a novel together. Wouldn't that have been an amazing thing to have read? Uh, you know, wow. like you're saying, because because they live on different continents, just the pragmatics of it didn't work out. But it's a fun kind of counterfactual to imagine a Twain McDonald novel. Um, but part of what interests me is that Twain is um, almost always seen as an anti-Christian skeptical figure. Right. And I think that... Um, it's kind of like we were talking about Dickens earlier. McDonald sees it, and I think McDonald is onto something. I think you know you, you can overdo this, but what Twain is really getting at is hypocrisy. He doesn't like when uh, Christians claim to be something they're not, when they um, say things that are uh, ridiculous but are supposed to be believed. Those kind of things. Um, but he, but there there was a, a real. Um, kind of spiritual side of Twain that respected authentic faith. He actually wrote a pretty touching uh, work on Joan of Arc once, for example, where, where you, you feel like he's saying, okay, here's now an authentic faith, not a hypocrite. Hmm. Um, and, and, you know, kind of the, the kind of person you are bring, can bring out of somebody something that's inside them that other people can't bring out. And I think McDonald's radiant, unapologetic, warm faith, not being a hypocrite in any kind of way, um, uh, not, you know, being judgmental and kind of moralistic in a, in a shrill way, uh, allowed Twain the freedom to express his own inner spiritual life. And so McDonald could draw that out of him. And, and McDonald was very convinced that Twain, uh, had a sincere spiritual interest in him, uh, even though most people, um, uh, couldn't see that. It's definitely evident that Twain was a guy who had a good time. And yeah. <laughs> as a satirist, and usually the successful satirists are not lackadaisical about morality or, or what's right and wrong. They're assuming it. And yeah. like you've been mentioning with uh, the most of the guys, interestingly enough, that we've talked about that are attacking hypocrisy. You know, they're assuming, yeah, I mean, a, of, they're assuming a standard. Yeah. Erasmus would be a, a classic example from the 16th century, right. you know, who's famous for his satire, but his satire is really a moral weapon. He, he's He's indignant at the way in which people are not living up to their own preaching. Right. I think uh, one of my favorite quotes of Twain is that someone asked him if um, he believed in baptism. baptism. And uh, he said, believe in it. I've seen it. Um, <laughs> but, hey, well, uh, okay. So uh, I'll, do, I'll do one back random yeah, to you, please, which I please, always yeah. love. Uh, so when uh, he wrote a very funny book called Innocence Abroad, uh, on a European and Holy Land tour, and it's this kind of uh, fake naive voice, which was particularly fun because a lot of readers 
thought he was being serious and reviewers even. Uh, but one of them is he gets to uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, uh, where Christ rose from the dead in Jerusalem. And there's also in the same building, the tomb of Adam. And so he, he falls down on his knees, according to his own account, and weeps and just says he was overwhelmed because it was so touching to be so far away from Missouri and find a blood relative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Twain. Yeah, that is definitely Twain. <laughs> um, now, if if you have a moment, I'd love to know, how how did you get up? How did, how did you get involved in all this? What what? Yeah, so so uh, yeah, I'm actually a historian, uh, so that's my main. But I'm prone to wander. Um, we have here at Wheaton College the Wade Center, which is dedicated to seven authors: um, Lewis and Tolkien and Chesterton and Sayers among them. Um, and it's the main repository for Lewis's papers. It has right. you know Tolkien's desk that he wrote the Lord of the Rings on. It's like got a lot of stuff that any university in the world would be proud to have. Um, and so one of the seven authors is MacDonald, and they have this lecture series, the Hanson Lectures, where every year a faculty member talks about one of the seven authors or a theme in the authors. And so they asked me to do it. I actually, I did think for a while about doing Chesterton. Uh, it was It was natural to ask me in some ways because my specialism is modern British history. Um, and particularly, I do more 19th century than 20th century, and I do particularly what are called the dissenters, the churches outside the established churches, uh, Baptist, Congregationalist, Methodist, people like that. And so if you do the math on all that, it's like uh, McDonald is just like standing right there waiting for me, you know, here's a, here's a Congregational uh, trained and ordained minister in the 19th century, um, and I've written a lot on congregationalists. Uh, so as I thought about what I wanted to do for the lecture, like I said, initially I thought maybe I'll do something on, on, on Chesterton. Uh, but McDonald really just called to me because it's like, okay, everything that I've been, I, I know all the context here. I know the training. Uh, uh, I know the background. And so I had some hope, which I think the book fulfills, uh, but you and other readers can decide that, that knowing the time period really well, knowing the theology of the time period really well, and the church life of the time period really well, that I would see things that uh, somebody who was just trained in literary studies might not see um, in the background. And so that was what I was trying to do. Is there anything new that you're working on? What, 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 um, if folks are, have enjoyed this, what, what can I point them to for you? Um, well, yeah, so the first lecture, as we mentioned, is George McDonald in the Age of the Incarnation. And I had so much fun with that that I uh, decided to do uh, the Oxford Handbook of Christmas. <laughs> and I actually just submitted that back to Oxford University Press yesterday. Um, so I'm excited about that coming out. I wrote the chapter on the 19th century, the, you know, this famous Victorian turn in Dickens with Christmas uh, myself. Um, but it's got 45 chapters with everything you could think of, you know, chapters on food and on Santa Claus and on the wise man, you know, whatever you could think of about Christmas, uh, we tried to make it comprehensive. Uh, and that was uh, loads of fun. That's brilliant. And, I, <laughs> and I'm just waiting my way now into a, a new project on Anglican chaplains in World War One. I, I want to see um, how they responded to the war, how they were trained before the war, what they did with their ministry after the war, how the war changed them, basically, is my question. Beautiful. And so when are you just submitted the one? Um, do you have a timeline on when that'll come out? Um, I hope it will come out um, maybe like September 2020. So we have uh, a good shopping season for the, for the 2020 Christmas um, sure. um, buying season. That's that's the idea. Yeah. Dr. Timothy Larson, thank you so much again for coming on and taking the time. I've, I've enjoyed it a lot. Thank you very much.